Okay, so this morning's lesson is to seek or to serve, and we know that as Christians, of course, our job is to do both. But it also depends on what you're seeking and what you're planning to serve. So, some people can go to church and they're thinking, oh, maybe they're seeking entertainment value. We see that so many times in a lot of the mainstream churches. They're going there to, you know, we're here to sing worship songs and there's a time and a place to have the grand, um, grand entertainment segment is what I call it. Um, to everyone on stage, um, you know, they have instruments everywhere. They're seeking, they're asking out for hallelujahs and you name it. So there are many people that go to these congregations that they're there to have the entertainment. They're there to see other people. They're there to maybe even serve a man as far as like a preacher, a minister, or anyone else in their life to be able to serve. But we know that we have to have the right heart for God. So the question is, is why do you go to church? Is it to seek the entertainment? Is it to seek the activities that may be happening after? Like, I'm sure we've all known somebody that they will only go to the church service if there's a big potluck after. <laughs> you haven't seen them in months, but they know that there's something going on after church. Or are we going to church because we are actively seeking God? That's what we should be doing, of course. And we know throughout our busy lives, of course, there are many things that come into the way. There are many temptations out in the world, and we can't control them. We can only control where our heart is, and we can control the way we think about things. So, there is an article that was written in 2004. It's called, The Young Adults Believe in God Aren't So Crazy About Church. Interesting stories, I'm sure none of us will be surprised by this. It was an article written by Kristen Campbell. And in that article, we can see as Christians that we're probably going to be disappointed with the results of what she found in this article. So there's a few different points here. Some excerpts from this article say that it's not that young people don't care. In fact, in the study, it shows that 80% of people in their 20s said their faith is very important in their lives. Nearly 60% claimed to have made a commitment to Jesus Christ, and three-fourths told the Barna Research Group of Ventura, which is where this article has come from through the study, that they prayed during the past seven days. These are all great things. On the outside, of course, we know how that works, and... Another excerpt says, but in a typical week, just three out of 10 of them attended services at church. Only 30% of adults in their 20s donated something to a church during the past year. The same percentage holds for those who have read the Bible during any given week. So, we know that 80% of these people say they have faith, that it's super important to them in you know, their 20s. Um, that 60% of them made a commitment. Well, we know what a commitment is, right? Commitment is no matter what, you're going to stick to something. A commitment as Christians is we need to commit to loving and serving Christ. If you don't keep his commandments, you don't love him. So further, in a different part of the article, it says one of the trends, in quote, one of the trends we're noticing is people are looking for something that's real, said uh, Charlie Grenade, singles pastor or preacher at um, a Daystream Baptist Church in Mobile, Alabama. Of course, everyone's looking for something real. I mean, that's going to be a mindset, though. What is real to you and what is going to greatly impact your life? And that can mean a few different things for people, and people do seek God differently. That is, this is true. But the problem is, especially with young people in this article specifically, when they're doing this study, is we're not seeing that commitment from the young people as they say. 
It's like they're, they're saying it, but they're not actually living the way they should be through a biblical lifestyle. So in quote in this article, college students are looking for a worship service when there is nothing fancy. This is a, the same uh, pastor at Day Springs Baptist Church. He says, adding that his church offers such an experience during its unplugged service on Monday nights. We know it's going to get people in. We're not here to put out big billboard signs and say, oh, come into these services. We have the live band. We have, we're not, we're not people of the world. That's, and the ads and the marketing for things like this are going to appeal to the younger people. And they know this. And unfortunately, that same aspect of things that is happening is bringing these young people into what we'll call false doctrination. They're not coming there to seek God. They're not coming there to learn more about the Bible. They are coming there because people are saying, come, we're going to have a great time. Of course people are going to come in. It's an easy way to get people in. So a lady named Sally uh, Morgan Taylor addressed such desires in her book, Worship Evangelism, inviting unbelievers into the presence of God. Quote, young people want to encounter the other at church, but they are not finding it there, she said. They're finding programs, they're finding games, they're finding cute things to do, but they're not finding an experience with the other they assume is there somewhere in the world. So, we've all known people that will come to church because they're like, well, this is a great place to meet people. And potentially even a love partner. I mean, I've kind of said it, and I don't know if we're all in agreement with this, but like Florida College, great place to learn and learn ministry and learn about Bible. But it has also been used a lot of the times to where people kind of wish spouse. Um, and I'm not saying it's used directly for that purpose, but you see a lot of it. And I think it's you have like-minded people there together, but also maybe that is a better opportunity for some who maybe aren't as social or they are out in the world as much to be able to find a spouse. And maybe some people go there for that direct reason. I don't, I'm not someone who knows how everyone thinks, so there is, there's always those options. So. When we think about this, we need to think that we need to seek God. We're not seeking entertainment. We're not seeking activities. We're not seeking fun, grand things. But so many other churches and congregations, as we know, even through this study, they offer this fantasy, this, we're going to do all these great things. We're going to have all these people. It's going to be such a wonderful time. We're going to be loud, we're going to worship God, but in their hearts, they're not really seeking God. They're seeking to be popular. They're seeking the approval of people of the world. And so, I mean, your feelings are kind of mixed when you read an article like that. Because you're like, okay, young people, they have this faith. They want to, they say they want to seek, but then we see they don't really attend church. They don't really pray. They don't really get into the Bible. It's more like... It's a feeling for them. It's, you know, these are the ways I feel. These are things that I say are important to me, but they're not really proving. So we can be encouraged that people want to find God and not just be entertained in church. But it makes you wonder if they realize there is more to church services than to seeking God. So... We can ask the question again, why do we go to church? To be entertained, to seek God, or is there another reason? One that might be as important as seeking God would be to seek that God is good. So, we'll start getting into some verses here. We know that when we seek God, of course he is good. He is the creator of all things. God is love. He brings us all together. He encourages us. And he is a source of sustenance and strength. We know that when we pray that when God for us to get strength, and he's going to give you strength one way or the other. He, you're either going to feel stronger, or he's going to give you an opportunity that you're going to be stronger because of what he's put in front of you. 
So in Psalm 34, 10, he says, The young lion suffers or suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. And in Psalm 105, 4, he says, Seek the Lord in his strength and seek his presence continually. So it's our job as Christians to look for God for strength and look for, know that with him there is not evil. There is no bad thing that comes through God. The next point we can get here is that he is the source of wisdom and understanding. And we know that the Bible, of course, is the source for all good things. It is the good word, and it was given to us through inspiration of God. And when we see all the things happening in the world, man, it can be disheartening. There is no if, ands, or buts about that. But it also gives us the encouragement that God is, he is our strength, he is our comfort, he is who we go to for these things, and he is the author of our eternal salvation. So in Proverbs 28, 5, it says, Evil men do not, evil men do not understand justice, but those who seek the Lord understand it completely. We know that the evil people in the world are not going to understand all the things that we are going to understand. Which is kind of baffling because I'll tell you what, the most evil being in the whole world understands better than anybody. And that would be Satan. And even the demons believe and tremble and they know. But we know that God wants us to seek him. And seek him only. And seek his ways and seek the truth and seek the life because we get all that through him. In Acts 17, 26 through 27, he said, And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. And that's powerful. God's never far away. He's right next to us all the time. If we continue to seek him <clears throat> in all things, he is always next to us. He will give us strength. He will give us comfort. And we all know Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. We know that when we seek God that we will get the things that we need because if the birds of the air and the, the grass and everything can grow with him who are we to not get everything from him when we seek him so of course the next thing we know is after we seek that God is good we have to have obedience and that can be some of the hardest things to do we're all people we all know what's going on in the world. We, it's easy to get distracted on things. It's easier to sometimes just do or look at mindless things on the internet or search through things, YouTube videos, Facebook, whatever. We know that we need to search the scripture daily as he talks about in Acts. So we know that the Father and the Son abide with us as we keep Jesus' commandments. We know that in John 14, 15, that he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So, how do we truly know Jesus and the Father? I'll tell you what, even Jesus was obedient for the things which he suffered. I believe that's in Mark 9, 1. Could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure. And God and Jesus are found when we obey their commands. So, we know that when we are doing the right things, we are praying, we are going through the many things that we are going through, and we are seeking him first, and we are following their commands because we love them so much that things fall into place. And these commands are the ones that we have to believe, to repent, confess, and be baptized. And I'm going to go through some of those scriptures so that we can find these things in the Bible. The first one, the command to believe. 
They'll be found in the Hebrews 11.6. It says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. The command to repent would be found in Acts 17, 30, and 31. It says, truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. You know, he's talking about Jesus here. He has given us that command to repent, to turn again, to turn away from our old life, and to seek God and to follow Jesus. He tells us to, we, we're commanded to confess. In Romans 10, 9 and 10, it says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And we know the plan of salvation as Christians, you hear the word, you believe, you repent, you confess, and then we are commanded to do what? To be baptized. In Mark 16, 16, is a great verse, especially for those who believe it's faith only. There's an important word in this verse. And this verse being, he who believes and is baptized will be saved but he who does not believe will be condemned so the most important word in that whole scripture is the word and as it is a conjunction that joins the two and gives them equal power believe and be baptized the reason he does not include but he who does not believe and who has not been baptized is because he knows that if you did not believe in the first place you would have never known to be baptized And of course, we know in Peter with Acts 2.38, he's talking to the Jews to be repent and be baptized. And in baptism, we are united with Christ. We can see this in Romans 6, verse 3 through 4, where he says, Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. We all know why we were baptized. At least I hope we do. And going through baptism, we put on Christ. That can be found in Galatians. Verse or chapter 3, verse 27. It says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now we know when we're baptized, the re baptism represents his death, burial, and resurrection. It's death to our old life. It is burying it in the water. And as we come up, we come up anew. We are born into a new life, and that represents his resurrection. When we are saved, the Lord then adds us to his church. We know in Acts 2.41, says, Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. So that tells you right there when Peter was talking to them, when he says, Repent and be baptized. And once they had heard his lesson and the things that he had to say, two, I'm sorry, three verses later, 3,000 souls, without hesitation, went and were baptized, and they were added to the church. And that will tell you right there that unless you were baptized, you're not added to the church. Because that was what was taught of them. So then we know that God can be found anywhere. And yes, this is a fun, said it'd be fun with this one. 
It's almost kind of like a kid's book. Oh, the places you'll pray. There is nowhere that you can't find God. There is nowhere in our lives that you can't talk to him through prayer. And there is no time that he is not there for us when we have felt forsaken by all others. And sometimes you can. Sometimes it's hard when you feel like maybe you're in a place of work and or you're in a place where almost nobody believes and you feel like you're being judged and you feel like nobody's there around you and you feel like maybe you're even in a dark place and you just feel that everybody has forsaken you. And that, that, can, be a, that can be a very hard place to be in and it's hard to see when you're in certain states of mind that people are there to care for you, they're there to love you, they're there to support you encourage you and to be in prayer with you and just know that even if you're in that situation and you feel like there is nobody there and you feel like nobody can do anything for you, God will always be next to you to lay his hand on you, to give you strength, to give you comfort, and you can always reach out to him. And to do that even in some very hard times, is so powerful in itself. And we can see that in Matthew 6, 6. He says, but will you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. We know that when we pray for things, they may not be exactly what we pray for. But we know that in any situation, these things are going to happen in God's timing and they are going to be God's will. And we have to trust in his process for our lives. And we know that when we're forsaken by others, you can see in 2 Timothy 4, 16 and 17, it says, At my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them, but the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. So we know that even when we are forsaken by all others, that Jesus, God, they are going to be there for us always. They are going to deliver us. So then why do we go to church? Well, we need to know that serving God is better than anything else that we can think of. We know that when we find God and we serve him and we seek him every day in our lives, that things continue to get better. I know that, you know, with me, I can always know when things are getting difficult and when I haven't been praying as much and when I haven't been seeking him as often as I should be. And it gets real hard. Things start to get harder in our lives. And we know that when we get to that point, we need to start seeking him as much as we, as much as we can. For this reason, in finding God, we must serve him. And we were cleansed by the blood of Jesus. In Hebrews 9.14, it says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? None of us are perfect. We've all done things that maybe we're not proud of. We've all had past lives. We've all continued to do things where, even though we were sinners, Jesus still died for us. There is only one perfect person that ever walked this earth, and that was Jesus Christ. We are going to make mistakes. But when we make mistakes, are we seeking God in those moments? Are we going to God? Are we serving him? Are we praying about it? Are we going to one another and trying to encourage one another to say, Brother, sister, how can I help you? Because that is how, when we serve one another, we serve God. For this reason also, we are receiving an unshakable kingdom. 
and we will continue to serve God in eternity. You can find that in Revelation 7, verse 15. He says, Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple, and he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. So even in eternity, we are serving God. And it should be no different than what we do in our everyday lives now. We want to serve God here, and we want to serve God in heaven, in eternity, and of course, we serve God in church. And this is where, of course, you're going to see a fair amount of scripture here, because there are so many things that are commanded us to do in church, in our services. So, as we offer the sacrifices of praise through song and prayer and spiritual songs, we are spiritual priests, and we are ordained to offer our spiritual sacrifices. And we do these things through the fruit of our lips. In Hebrews 13, 15, it says, Therefore by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. So we know that in church, we are offering these things to God with our mouths. We are here to teach. We are here to sing praises. We are here to be there for one another, to serve one another, to encourage one another, to build each other up brings us to our next point, edifying one another. Hebrews 10, 24-25 says, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So it's important for us to be with one another. In one way or the other, we are family. We are brothers and sisters and it is important, especially when we are in church together, to have that heart for one another. Praying for others. We know that we should be doing this daily. Pray without ceasing. Pray for our own anxiety. Pray for our mental health. Pray for those around us. Pray for good health in people. Pray for safe travels. Praying for our food. Or just... Having a day, whether it be hard or good, to thank God for all the many blessings in our lives. And that could be as simple as, thank you for allowing me to wake up today. And some days, trust me, you might not feel like that because everything's been so difficult and it's been hard and maybe you just haven't gotten any sleep and you want to continue to sleep for longer. But continuously pray to him and talk to God and pray for others especially our brothers and sisters, but it's also the people who don't have Christ because they don't know that feeling. And of course, we know the first day of the week partaking in the Lord's Supper. That is something that we do on the first day of the week to remember his death, burial, and resurrection. We take the bread, which represents his, broken, his son's broken body, and we take the fruit of the vine, which represents the blood that he shed, when you think about the pain and the sacrifice that he went through willingly as a man, feeling all the things that he felt, and he continued to put himself on that cross, and every time we sin, we put him back on that cross. And these are all the things we need to think about. Because we know that when we remember him through the Lord's Supper and all the things that he went through, we do this in a heart that is pleasing to him. And we need to go every day remembering those things and when we know when we sin that we do exactly that again. And then giving and giving thanks. So we know that we as Christians give a lot. 
we should be giving thanks in church. We should be giving things for our blessings and all the things we have in our life and also giving back to the church, whether that be with our spiritual gifts, with teaching, song leading, um, you know, kids classes, wonderful. Giving that time, that effort, that your heart to the people in the congregation so that we all are edifying and being there for one another so that we can have a chance to make it to heaven because that is our ultimate goal is to be in heaven together. So are we in church to seek or are we here to serve? So assembly not to seek, but for the opportunity to serve. And we can serve through devotion and service to his children, which is all of us. Um, because of course we serve one another through encouragement to all who attend. And we should always be encouraged to come to church and to be there with one another. So in conclusion, regarding the reasons one may go to church, I will suggest that as Christians, it is not to be entertained against which Paul warned. It is not even to seek God or experience the other, for we already are his children. We assemble together as a church for the opportunity to serve. We are here to serve. Even Jesus served. He was not above serving because he wanted to show his apostles and he wanted to show us that even though he was the most perfect being, he didn't have to do any of it. We know that he got baptized by John to show that this is what needed to be done. He washed the feet of the lady coming into the house to show that we serve one another. And even when the apostles were talking about who's going to be the best, he said, the least of you is at the top. Because we also know the story about the 99 and 1. He wants the 1. The 99 righteous, he knows, has the gift. He's going after the 1 that is falling away. He is going after the 1 that needs him most. He is there for that 1 that serves, that will need to be served the most. And that's what we are to do as Christians. To serve God through, the, through our acts of devotion and to serve his children through the same means. With this attitude, it will not matter whether we assemble with 10 people or 10,000. We still offer our service to our Lord and Creator, and we still encourage those who are present. And when we know, I mean, there's three of us, four of us. Um... We're going to serve each other more than the people in the 10,000. Mm -hmm. They may be able to, you know, bigger churches, they may be able to serve like a bigger like community area as far as like each person, if they help one person or two people, that can spread real fast. But the smaller congregation, as far as serving one another, for one, there is no excuse. <laughs> and there is no option not to serve in the church and for one another. We all have a part in doing something here. And when we assemble with an attitude and readiness to serve God and our brethren, we will get more out of any service we attend because our heart is into it. We're putting our spirit in there. We are giving up that sacrifice. It will be for the more one puts into something, the more they will get out of it especially with us. And as Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. In Acts 20, verse 35, Jesus says, I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. We know that as Christians, we get more blessings when we serve people. Mm -hmm. We get more blessings when we are there for one another. We get, there's something in the human mind that says, yes, I like to receive, 
but you feel so much better about yourself when you give to others. It's, and I think it's the expression that you get on someone's face. It's the happiness that you can bring somebody. It's the fact that you know that you did something kind and loving towards another person. And in my opinion, that is God 100%. That is what he created us to do, to serve one another, to be there for one another, and to give with an open heart. So have you found God through faith and obedience to his son? If so, are we willing to serve God and his children both in and out of the assemblies of the church? Those are important questions. When we go out into the world, are we serving ourselves or are we serving others? Are we giving to ourselves or are we giving to others? Are we seeking God? Are we following his commandments and doing all the things that he tells us to do in our lives in church? When we're in church, are we looking for entertainment? Or are we looking to serve God in all the ways that we can? That is the end of my lesson. Our song of invitation will be he lives. So we know that Jesus lives in us all. He is there with us through everything. And we can call on him at any point in our days. And we should. Because we know that we can't do everything on our own. It's too hard. Life is a whole lot easier when you have God front and center.